So last time I was using a clock that was off by two to three minutes. Uh, this time I will hopefully use the correct clock and start and end on time. So sorry about that issue last time. So today we're going to talk about, give an elementary, very elementary introduction to modeling regulatory networks. This is to prepare for Hiroshi Kokubu's talk uh, on detecting morse decompositions of the global attractor regulatory networks by time series data. Uh, so his talk will be Friday of next week as part of that IMA workshop. And he recommended several papers, one of which gave some basics about uh, regulatory networks. So we're going to go and discuss this paper as recommended by Kokuba. Um, for the topology, we will unfortunately run out of time before we get to the topology. So for the topology, you will just have to uh, anticipate his lecture on Friday and figure out where the algebraic topology comes in. But there will be some good algebraic topology on Friday, as well as the rest of the week. Any questions there? OK. So this is an example of a regulatory network. Uh, they're often far more complicated, uh, and they may leave out a number of details, but let's just take a look at uh, this part right here. We've got gene 4. It gets transcribed, and so it creates a protein called X4. Uh, thus, the transcription of gene 4 regulates the amount of protein X4 that you have. X4 also will help activate gene 2. So there can be an edge, a directed edge between gene 4 and gene 2, because gene 4 will help activate the expression of gene 2, thus getting the protein X2. Similarly, we can descri transcribe gene 2, and so you've got a relationship between gene, sorry, gene 1, making protein X1, and then proteins X1 and X2, they get together, so these two get together, and they will help activate gene 3. So we can draw edges between uh, so I was going to do it from the genes. You can involve the proteins, so there's nothing wrong with involving the proteins. I thought there was an eraser here, but you can involve the proteins if you want to. But most of the time for today's talk, we'll be looking at gene regulatory networks. But one can look at protein interaction networks, all sorts of things. But in this case, I'm interested in my genes, but I could have involved my proteins as well and have a more complicated graph. But the graph I want says that gene 1 affects via protein 1, gene X3, it activates that. And gene 2 via protein X2 activates gene 3. And so thus we get protein 3. And then protein 3 comes on and helps activate gene 2. And so you also have a double arrow going, actually it represses. So they have, if it activates, it's an arrow. If it represses, it's a bar. That notation will vary. In many cases, we'll just do an R for both activation and repression. So what that means is once gene 3 turns on and makes protein 3, well, then protein 3 will start repressing gene Two, and so thus we will get less of gene X2. Uh, you have very complicated mechanisms where you might want to transcribe it, but maybe gene, the protein X3 binds here and you can't transcribe the gene X2. So, this, so in this case, we're saying that gene X3 represses gene X2, but gene X2 along with gene X1, they both activate gene X3. And so that would be our network we would have if I only looked at the genes. We would have um, arrows from X4 to X2, X2 and X1, and then 
a bi-directional arrow here, but that would be a repressing type thing. I think that's our arrows corresponding to just the genes. So that's an example of a regulatory network. Any questions about that? Well, regulatory networks, uh, so here's another example of a simple regulatory network. Here we've got, so this is a different example, gene one will help activate gene two. It does that by creating a protein that will then interfere with uh, the transcription of gene two. Sorry, interfere, but interfere in a positive way. So it'll actually help the transcription. So you'll get more of gene two. And uh, it also helps activate gene three, but gene three will repress gene one. And then the two together, the two together will come along and activate gene two. And you can see that via a time interval. We've got our gene one, our gene one, maybe it gets expressed and then, you know, it gets expressed somewhere along here. And then we have our other two uh, genes, gene two gets activated, gene three also gets activated. As gene two gets activated, as gene three gets activated, it starts repressing gene one. And so we can see that gene one now uh, starts to decay, having less and less of gene one. Well, you can see what happens to the other curves as well. And so we can understand uh, how gene one affects gene two, affects gene three, and vice versa. So we can see that via this nice regulatory network, this nice graph. So that gives us some good information. It does tell us that once we have gene one, so once we have gene one, then with these two activating arrows, arrows, we will start getting genes one, genes two, and gene three. But once we have gene three, gene one will start being repressed. And so we know basically the directionality of how much, you know, if we're creating more or decaying in terms of these genes. But we can get more information, and the more information that we can get is with each of these edges, there's actually a differential equation. So we've got for gene one, gene one, the change in G1 is going to be affected by gene three as well as gene one. You'll notice often depending upon how much of gene one you have, there is a decay rate. So this minus here for each of these, there is a decay rate. The genes get transcribed into RNA, which gets translated into protein, but both the RNA and the protein will eventually decay. It'll, there are proteins that will eat them up and break them up into their small constituent parts. And so, once, just because you've made gene one, it's not constantly increasing or staying steady, you do have a decay here as well. And that decay, uh, you know, you might have less transcription of it, so depending upon what you're measuring, uh, you may have less transcription of it, so we often have this decay term right here. But then we can see that gene three activates. We can also see the relationship between uh, gene one and gene two. So we've got this other formula for how, uh, so this is, so how this is gene three represses. So being just on the bottom here, we'll actually be getting less of gene one from this formula here as well. Here, gene two, this differential equation, the rate of change, this will actually increase as gene one increases. And if we take a look at gene three, we can see it depends both on gene one as well as on gene two. So with these graphs, there's also a whole bunch of differential equations, and they are usually nonlinear. So we've got a mess, and the mess is worse than just what we see here.
because the mess includes parameters. We've got these parameters here. And those parameters you hope are determined via experiments, but often they're done via computer simulation, and often they're actually unknown. Sometimes you have bounds on them, but you often actually don't know these parameters. Uh, note that we will often use the term parameters for these constants, so these constants k, i, j. These are constants, and we call them parameters. And then in terms of the genes, those are variables. My bamboo is very slow today. OK. So these are variables. And you can see that they vary with respect to time. They vary with respect to time. But generally speaking, these constants are constants that don't vary with respect to time. And so that's parameters. And we can talk about the parameter space and the variable space. Frequently, there are things that are known about the relationship between various parameters and and variables, and so you can talk about the parameter space or the variable space or how the two interact. Any questions about that? Uh, networks can be very complicated, and this actually isn't the most complicated network I found on the web, but this was, you know, one. There are lots of uh, uh, proteins, lots of genes that affect each other. And so we can get lots and lots and lots of edges and lots of vertices. Quite complicated. So let's take a look at another uh, simple case. So in this case, we have that uh, if I take a look at gene A, it's going to be a function of both the amount of A you have as well as the amount of B that you have. So we've got, there's a self-regulating thing, a self-loop here. And then B actually represses A, and A represses B, uh, which you can see the uh, in terms of these uh, graphs, the more B you have, the less A you've got, the more A you have, the more A you have. And so we can take a look at these phase portraits. Uh, since there's only three curves shown, I'll show another one on the next page. But basically, we've got these things where we've got the derivative of A with respect to T is going to be a function of X sub A and X sub B. And same thing over here with B, we've got that this is maybe also is also a function of A and B. But we can solve that, and then we'll get, we may be able to solve it. X sub A in terms of T, we'll get a nice function here. And then we can solve this thing and get a nice function here. But we could also get a X sub B in terms of X sub A. And if we get x sub b in terms of x sub a, that's our phase plane right here, where we can see trajectories as uh, x sub a is decreasing from 1 to 0. We can see that x sub b starts decreasing, but then starts increasing again, if we start here. If we start over here, X sub, as x sub b decreases from this number to 0, as x sub b decreases, x sub a first decreases. So x sub a decreases, and then it increases again. So those are two possible trajectories. A third trajectory is both x sub a and x sub b decreasing. So depending upon your initial conditions, there's lots of different choices that one can have. Um, to see that in a simpler situation in terms of a linear system. Now, we are interested actually in nonlinear. But linear differential equations are a little bit easier to, to think about. So if I've got this differential equation right here, I can get 
plot my x versus my y. And I've got a variety of choices I can choose. The nice thing about linear systems is, is if I fix a, at time t naught a particular value, and if I fix uh, the same thing for my variable y, a y naught, if I choose a particular initial condition, then we know what the path will be for nice linear systems. So for nice linear systems, if I know a particular point at a particular time, so say at t equals to 0, I'm supposed to be at this point for x and y, so for my x and my y, then I can see my trajectory. I can see basically what it's doing. And so depending upon your initial conditions, then we can be in, we can have various different patterns going along. I might have an initial condition that just sends me nicely like this. There's lots of different things that one might do. So one of the things is the behavior of our system depends upon our initial conditions. If it's nice and linear, it uniquely depends, uh, assuming everything, you know, if we have, for example, constant coefficients or nice coefficients, they don't have to be constant. Uh, but in many cases, uh, our initial values will give us a unique path. For nonlinear systems, our initial conditions may not necessarily there. You could actually have things intersecting. So this initial condition could correspond to both this and this path. We don't have that here, so we don't have this path. But for nonlinear systems, things can get more complicated. But knowing an initial condition does limit the possibilities. The other thing that determines the end, but notice for this particular case, we have an attractor that no matter what my initial condition is, I'm going to be going towards this attractor. And so I've got this nice attractor right here. The other thing that, affect, that uh, can affect our differential equations and our solutions is our parameters right here. So these constants right here, if I change them, it can change my output. For linear systems, this is very well understood. And depending upon the determinant and trace of the matrix, you might have things that are spiraling out, things that are spiraling in, things that are just circling around nice and stably. You can have systems like this systems that do, you know, various different things go out, you know, saddles. Uh, so you can have a number of different things going on. Uh, and your system might be spiraling out, so you've got a node that's unstable or spiraling in with a stable node. You can also have your parameters being fairly stable. If I'm at this point in terms of my trace and my determinant, I'm not going to define that, but it's affected by if I have that, if I go back over to here and turn this into a matrix, minus 4, minus 1, minus 3, 2, then I can determine points using the trace and the determinant. And I can see that if I'm in any place in this region right here, I will have a stable spiral. So changing my parameters slightly, I will still have a stable spiral. It might look a little bit different, but I'll still have a stable spiral anywhere within this region. Versus if I go over to this region right here, I get an unstable spiral. And if I'm on here, well, if I perturb it just a little bit, I'll either get a stable spiral or an unstable spiral. So I've got a dividing line between my stable spiral and my unstable spiral, as well as a dividing line between my unstable spiral and my unstable node, and a dividing line between nodes and saddles. So linear systems are quite well understood, and these are basically the majority of the pictures that you would see. The reason I mention them is because nonlinear systems can often be approximated locally with linear systems. You did this in Calc 1 where you use tangent lines to locally approximate a complicated curve. Well, now we can use locally 
you know, we can approximate nonlinear differential equations with linear differential equations in many cases. So locally, we might get something. So in a nonlinear system, maybe locally you might have this, but then maybe someplace over here, you might instead going into a center point instead or into a, you know, spiral eventually. So depending upon where you are, you might have various different interesting points going on, these nice critical points that we have. So that is a basic review of differential equations. Most of what we're going to do today, though, is graph theory. So there are differential equations behind all this, but we'll have just a lot of graph theory because we're looking at networks. To actually get the differential equations is difficult. We need these parameters, but to observe the dynamics is quite difficult. So often one just has a variety of snapshots. You, know, you can do your uh, microarray data at various time points and get snapshots but often one just has snapshots of pieces of information. The other thing, it, which we'll mention later on, we'll be able to detect this using the methods discussed in this paper, is that your regulatory network may be incomplete. We might not know of a molecule that's involved. So you might have this you know, complicated network with you know, lots of points, and lots of nodes and arrows and stuff like here. But maybe there's this other molecule that also has an effect, and you just don't know about it. The biologists have not discovered it yet. And that's actually quite common. So you don't know the entire network often. The other thing is the information on just the regulatory network. So we are going to focus on the regulatory network. So we will focus on these regulatory networks. but. In terms of these regulatory networks, they don't tell us the dynamics. For that, we need the differential equations. So we need to have both these uh, messy differential equations as well as the graph. We need both to fully understand the system. But today, we will focus very much on the graph. But we will mention the equations from time to time. Any questions there? So this is one of the examples that we will look at. This is the gene regulatory network of cell differentiation and the development of this organism. So basically, as it grows from an embryo into an organism, we've got the cell differentiation going on, and that will affect the regulatory stuff. The original network did include 16 repressive cell loops. I don't know where they are, so I'll just draw one here. But we want to simplify the network as much as possible. So one of the things that we're going to do is get rid of the self loops. Why can we do that? Well, let's take a look at something simple here. We know that many of our equations have this decay thing. So there's something that decays. So this is the example we looked at first, where the rate of change of gene 2 depended upon g 1, as well as the decaying of the, you know, getting less and less transcription of gene 2. Well, a more general function is the rate of change of xk will be a function of a variety. So ik is basically a, a set of, you know, so it might be xi1, xi2, xi3 to xi, you know, something here. So it will be a function of several variables. In this particular example, uh, x i k only corresponds to gene 1 and just gene 1. But it can be a function of many variables. It could be a function similar to this, or it might be a different function. Then we also have the decay we generally have the decay with respect to XK. So XK eventually, you know, it doesn't just keep, if you had a gene constantly making more and more stuff uh, and increasing in its rate of making more and more protein, uh, your body wouldn't like that. So eventually you need to have something where you start, you know, not, you know, you don't want to continually increase. At least you want to, you know, level off someplace. And so often one has this decay. 
if there is some repressive loop, so maybe there is a repressive uh, loop right here, where gene, the activation of gene 2 actually represses gene 2, um, we can just swallow it up in this function. So this function will just swallow up. So any loops where this is repressive, it will swallow it up. If there is a loop that is an activator, well, then we'll put it into IK, and so we will actually keep any uh, activator self-loop. So if a loop is activating, we keep it, but if it's repressive, we'll delete it, just because we can move that information into this mathematical equation by moving it into the decaying part. Questions there? The other thing that we will do is reduce the network by successive removal of nodes without an input or without an output. So there are some choices here, but let's take a look at this thing right here. Gene 2 depends upon gene 1. So yeah, there's a decay thing as well, but it depends upon gene 1. So if I know what gene 1 is, then I can solve this differential equation and know what gene 2 is. In other words, given this e differential equation and given a time course for gene 1, then I know gene 2. What we want to know is the minimal number of genes that we need to know in order to determine the time courses for all other genes. So what's the minimum number of you know, time courses for various genes, what's the minimal number of genes that we need to know that will then determine the time courses for all other genes. In this case, we don't need gene 2, we don't need gene 2, because if we know the time course for gene 1, we can plug it into this differential equation, and then we can solve this differential equation to get the time course for gene 2. So thus, given a regulatory network like this will remove all of these things because if I want to know what this is, there's a differential equation here relating these two, and so I'll go ahead and get rid of that edge. I'll get rid of this edge. I'll get rid of that edge. Anytime there is only an input and no output, so if you look closely, all of these arrows go input, 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 and so we can get rid of that. And so the idea is to, by successful removal of these nodes with no output, you know, so if I've got something here, there's no output, then I can remove it because this, and maybe there's several inputs, there could be several inputs, but if I know these three, then I can get rid of this one because I can determine this one here based upon these three. So we remove these three, along with these edges, and then I can look to see this one. If there is no output now, maybe this was the only output, so now maybe I can say that this one only depends, say, on these two. And so I don't need this one anymore, because these two will determine it. So these two will determine this, which will then determine that. And so thus we do the successful removal of nodes, saying that we don't need to know, uh, we don't need to know this will determine this, which will, you know, these will determine this, these will determine this, and so thus we don't need to know those, so we remove those nodes. So that explains why we don't need, if they don't have an output, they're determined by their inputs, so we don't need those nodes. If we want to just determine the minimal number of nodes to control the entire system, and that's what we want to do, is find the minimal number of nodes to control the system. And if a gene only has inputs and no outputs, well, it's not going to control anything. It will be controlled by other things, and so we certainly don't want it to be in the set of nodes needed to control other nodes. The other thing is you can also remove nodes without any input. Suppose I had a node here, 
that didn't have any input. The question is, I could, you know, maybe depending upon which direction you might remove this, if there's no inputs into this thing here, I can't tell which direction that's going, but maybe the arrow actually points, so I don't want to get rid of this one here. But if this one has, or let's put in a couple of these things right here. This one has no input. This one determines this, determines this. But if you're trying to control a biological system, so if I want to control a biological system, the question is, should I control this variable? So remember, my genes correspond to my actual variables in my differential equation. So do I want to control this variable? this variable or this variable. I can control this variable because it will determine this variable by this edge. Or I could control this variable because this one will control this one by this edge, which will then control a bunch of other things. But if you want to control things, maybe you want to control this rather than this because biologically speaking, maybe you don't know the entire network. Maybe you weren't aware that there really was this molecule out here that was actually involved in this, and you just didn't know that. Um, or maybe you'd like to know the different molecules. We can always trace back, and, and the biologist can then choose which ones to then effect. But notice that the reason we want to find the minimal number of nodes to control the system is if you want to, for example, kill cancer cells, if you can control certain nodes, we can control lots and lots of other nodes. So notice, just by re doing a successful removal of nodes without input or output, we went from 80 genes to 7 genes. So by controlling only these 7 genes, we can now control 80 genes. That's pretty powerful. So in terms of biology, if you want to control something, if I try to control this one down here, well, I might have difficulties because it's being controlled by a bunch of other things. So these are the ones that I'd want to control. I'd want to control these seven. Questions up to here. Well, I lied. I don't want to control those seven. In reality, I only need to control this one. So. Our first step was to remove those, um, was to remove repressive loops. Our second step was to re reduce the network by successful removal of nodes without input or without output. Our third step is to then see what is really necessary. Notice if I have this one here, it will determine node one. So now I know node one. Uh, sorry, let me do that again. Uh, that one has two inputs, so let's get rid of this for now. Uh, if I know this node, this one will determine this one right here, and so I can determine this one. So it only has one input, so this node has just one input. So knowing this gene, the time course for this gene, will give me the time course for this gene. So now I know these two time courses, so now I know these two time courses. Well. This gene here is controlled by these two, but I know these two, I know these two, and so now I can use that to determine this time course. And so now, I can act, given just this, I now know these three time courses. Well, I have three arrows going from those into this, so I can use that to determine this time course. This one here is determined by these two, so I can use that to determine this time course. And since I know these, I can use these two as well as this third one to determine this time course. And then I can use this one here to determine this time course. So what I really needed was just this one gene. And that one gene will actually control these seven genes, which will then control these 80 genes. So the question is, how do we find that one gene? So just to review, the idea is we want to control an entire network via just a few nodes. I don't need to know this one because if I know this one, so this is, we're saying maybe this is periodic with this particular period, and we 
knowing this will output a particular solution for this. Um, knowing this will affect this one here. So yeah, there is an effect, but knowing this will determine some time course for that. But we would like to control using just as few nodes as possible, knowing this determines this, determines that. Notice the cycle here. I could have made a different choice in terms of trying to determine these three right here. But if I know this, that determines this, that determines this. And so, yeah, this one affects this, but I'm saying if I know this one completely, then I know these other two here as well. And so with this cycle, I really don't need, you know, so there's two things. One of the things is if I've got a tree type structure, then knowing one of these things also gives it. But if I've got this cycle, I can then remove this and see if I just have the trees left. And so what we want to do is create a feedback vertex set, which is actually a subset of vertices and the directed graph says that the removal of the set, by remove the set, leaves a graph without directed cycles. So if I've got a cycle, that means I've got some redundancy in my system. And if I remove a node corresponding to a cycle, then I remove some of that redundancy. So if I go along here and remove this vertex right here, well, I've had before that this one controlled this, which controlled this, which controlled that, which controlled this. Notice that when I remove this and all the edges associated to it, what I'm left with is a tree where I know that this controls this, but now that I'm outside of this, I've got a nice tree structure in terms of what is controlling. And so if I remove the redundant information corresponding to cycles, then what I get left over is, yeah, this will affect this, which will affect that, which will affect that, and we've got this nice tree. But notice I'm, I'm talking about directed cycles. If this had gone the other direction, if I removed this arrow and went here, well, then I wouldn't be able to get out. I wouldn't have been able to connect to this tree right here. I need to be able to connect to the tree and I can connect to the tree if there was a cycle involved here. And so if we remove all the, the thing, a vertex that gets rid of these redundant cycles, well then I do have this now gets me to this tree and that will then for give me everything else. Questions about that? So finding the minimal set is equivalent to finding a subset of vertices in the directed graph such that removing them removes those redundant directed cycles for that information, you know, that we don't actually, that if we have this, that will therefore determine everything else. Questions there. So as some examples, we've got here, I could remove any one of these three, it doesn't matter which one. Suppose we remove this one, well then this determines this. In this case, if I remove this one, I still have a cycle here, a directed cycle, so I also have to remove this one. And so now I'm left with just this. But if this is my feedback vertex set, then these two will determine this value. Similarly, we can remove these three vertices here to get rid of any cycles. So now I would just have these two vertices but knowing these does give us the, so knowing the gray things in our feedback vertex set will determine our time courses for our white genes here as well. So if I know my feedback vertex set here, then I will know all of these. And this is the minimal thing that if I remove it, I removed all cycles. And so if I remove it, then I would just be left with these trees right here. And so what, left with these trees right there, I know that this thing will get me into this tree. And then once I'm in the tree, I can get every place else. Um, and same thing over here. If I remove this one here, then I'm left with things where I can now determine things 
I shouldn't actually have said tree because I'm thinking non-directed graphs. In here, I don't have, notice I don't have a cycle here because I can go here. So I can, let me do that in terms of, sorry about using the term cycle, uh, sorry, tree. But I can go here so I can think about this sort of being as a branch of a tree. So I can do this but I can't get back over here. There's no way for me to get back over here. So this, you know, knowing this gives me this, and then once I know this, I know all of this, as well as this, as well as that, but I don't get information back again. I don't have a cycle because the arrow goes the wrong way. Questions about that? So, these would be the one circled in red are our feedback vertex set. Questions there. So in this case, our feedback vertex set is just this one gene, and this one gene is sufficient to control all the remaining other genes. And we can see that partially by actually noticing that this gene is a function of OTX, as well as twist-like, so it's a function of OTX and twist-like. Uh, my nodal gene is a function of FOX and FGF, so it's a function of FOX and FGF, but I can write my FGF in terms of FOX, so I can write my, uh, my FGF in terms of FOX right here. And so we can replace uh, this, you know, this thing here, which is a function of FOX and FGF, to be instead a function of FOX. And FGF is a function, FGF is a function of FOX. And so we can replace this and make it just a function of FOX. And so all of these, we can have our only variable is in terms of our FOX. We can see that in terms of our equations, that the only variable that we have is everything can be written in terms of the FOX. And we can use this graph to do that. So questions about that. Well, does our cell differentiation depend only on FOXD. According to our results, it does. So according to these results, we only need to know FOXD, and then we can get everything else in terms of our FOX gene. But biologically, is this actually true? Mathematically, it's true, but it'd be nice when you're doing math biology if mathematically true implies biologically true. So we can check using biology data. Unfortunately, biology data is often insufficient. You might just have a snapshot. Here we've got a snapshot of what genes are activated at a particular time in various different cells. That doesn't give us any good information. We don't have enough information, so we can't check it using biology data. But one can do simulated data, and so one can check it via simulated data. And if you find out using either biology data or simulated data that does not depend then you know your regulatory network is incorrect. It's missing either some edges or some nodes. So it's missing nodes, vertices, or edges. So we know mathematically, if our graph is correct, that it must depend only on FOXD. But if we find out using either biology data, which is usually not available, or simulated data, that, you know, it's, uh, uh, that it does not, doesn't depend just on this, it, it depends upon something else, then we know that our regulatory network needs more work. And so that's one thing that this thing will, you know, do. Questions there. And so in the simulated data, they assumed that it was either this function or this function. They chose this function at random of having an edge between vertex J and vertex K. They assumed that was the function that gave it, and they took the product of these functions. If you had many arrows going into your vertex K, 
Uh, and then uh, the differential equation was given by this equation right here. One could solve it, uh, at least numerically. And then you get a bunch of, uh, if we do this in terms of using our Fox D, they did a thousand sets of choices for regulatory functions. Remember, we could choose either this one or this one, and so that was randomly chosen for various different edges. And so a thousand different choices were made for the function, and a thousand different initial states for each function. So we have a million different trials, a million different trials. And then did it actually correctly identify, because this is all blue, Fox D did correctly identify. Versus if I tried to do it as a function of just nodal, here it did not identify. So in this red region here, it did not identify. Here this is okay, but over here we did not get identification. Did not get identification. So there were some trials that did not. And here you mostly work. In most cases, twist like one was actually pretty good at you know controlling the rest of the stuff. But Fox D was absolutely perfect. Questions about that? They also did another function and got basically the same result. So some of the things that uh, were so oh so this is just a repeat. We're running out of time, so we'll skip repeats. This is the reduced signal construction network, and this is a feedback vertex set. set that's circled in red. So this is all you need. These five vertices are all you need in order to control the rest of the network. But the vertex set is not unique. That's why I used A instead of the. I'm constantly correcting theses where I change A's to the's or the's to A. This is non-unique. So A, I need to say A feedback network. I could have actually chosen, instead of this one, maybe we could have chosen this or this or that instead of this one right here. And there's actually 36 different choices I could choose, for example, this gene, this gene, this gene, this gene, and this gene. And since there are two choices here, two choices here, three choices here, oops, sorry, this is just one gene. One choice here, two choices here, three choices here, three choices here. There's 18 possibilities for this combination. Or another possibility is you could have this, this gene, one of these three, this gene here, or one of these six for another 18 possible choices for a total of 36 possible choices for the minimal feedback vertex set. So then the question is, which one do you want to choose? Well, you could say, which one is easier to modify biologically? Or you could also take a look at the graphs. So depending upon which collection it is in, so this is collection number of one consists of these things here. So I could either have, so I could have this gene or either this one or this one or that one, uh, or in group six. I could have this one, this one, and if I have this one, then it's this one and one of these four, or if I have this one, then it's this one or one of these ones here, and so there's lots of different choices um, uh, that one can have, but in terms of the regulatory networks, if I take one thing in here, one thing in here, and one thing in here, then the regulatory networks that we get the regulatory networks that we get are these possibilities. And you'll actually note that this right here is the simplest one. So this is probably choosing something in regulatory network one is probably best because these all have extra edges associated with them and sometimes a few extra edges associated with them. So the best one from a mathematical perspective, biologists might say, well, even if it has more edges, this might be easier to modify. But from a mathematical perspective, any combination within here, so choosing either this or this or that, you know, so uh, that would be one of the possibilities, that one of the better choices. 
questions there. Okay. Uh, there's other things where we can actually control the stuff. So let me just get to, there's lots and lots of variables, but we only need some nodes to control all those variables, lots of parameters. Uh, that was actually supposed to say parameters, not variables. Um, but just to quickly summarize, um, you can identify a small feedback vertex set such that the behavior of the entire system can be identified. So that was the sort of thing that if I know the time course for this one, I can determine the time courses for this one. If it does not depend upon this, then we know our regulatory network is incorrect. So these are supposed to be bullet points right here. The third bullet point that we didn't have much time to discuss is that we have a nice criterion that we can select key molecules to control the system. So if I know my, my feedback vertex set, then I know that if I control this, then I also control that. So if I control the feedback vertex set system, I can control the dynamics of the entire system. So feedback vertex systems give you power. So they are quite good. Any questions on any of that? Well, I hope you enjoy next week's workshop. If you do have questions, uh, please let me know. Remember, we will not have normal class period. You should instead listen to a few workshops for next week. You do have good preparation for most of the talks for next week. Any questions? I hope you enjoy the INA workshop next week.